Good afternoon and welcome to the British Library. Thank you for being here for this incredible event. We're ever so excited because we've been trying for so hard and for so long to make this happen. Special credit to my colleague Brett Walsh who's worked really hard on this festival. Um, but we're really excited to welcome John Callow who's written the most extraordinary book which is on sale outside. Oh. Fill your boots, knock yourselves out and there'll be signings afterwards. Um, so John, Shallow will, John Callow will be in conversation with Shami Chakrabarti. I'd like you to join me in a ginormous round of enthusiastic applause. <laughs> Woo! Over to you. <laughs> well, thank you for your um, enthusiastic applause. Um, and, um, and, and welcome to, to John. And, and John, congratulations again on this wonderful book. Um, which I've had the privilege of reading twice, um, once um, in, in proof, hence, hence I lent my endorsement to it on the, on the jacket, and, and, and then in the last 24 hours. Um, and I really, I really can't commend it enough, not just for the meticulous history, which I think is really important, and some of it not conventional wisdom, which we'll come to in a moment, but also, I think, very much for um, contemporary relevance. And what we mean, what we mean by witch hunts, and how it is that people, uh, particularly poor women in the world, uh, come to be come to be demonised in the way that the Biddeford witches were. Um, so I'm going to um, ask John um, some questions just to open up the discussion, and he will be able to sort of introduce the work, and then we'll allow plenty of time for for some discussion. Um, in the audience. So, so do you think, as we're going through, about what you'd like to ask or say? So questions are obviously uh, welcome, but also comments. And my favourite is, um, is, is a, a comment that's very thinly disguised as a question. <laughs> and, uh, and being a British Library audience, you will be well-versed in how to do this. You, you, you have a little rant about anything that's on your mind. And you can end, beginners can end with, don't you think? <laughs> um, but the, but the, the proper aficionados don't even need to say, don't, don't you think? You can just kind of elevate your voice at the end of a sentence as if you're <laughs> French or Australian or something like that. So do, so do you think about things you'd like to, you'd, you'd like to contribute as, as we go through? John, first of all, why witches? Now, this is not your, this is not your first book about, I mean... You, you'll know that John is an expert um, in, the, in the history of so-called witchcraft and has written, uh, uh, written and, and, and um, broadcast on this subject. But, to, you know, to a lot of people, this will seem like a slightly, you know, off the beaten track um, history. What, what is it that, that has drawn you and your scholarship to, to, this, to this area? I think it's a great question, and it's one that continually so, sort of comes back to you, because witches, by their very nature, are a marginal interest. It concerns marginal people, and for very long, certainly until really, maybe even the late 1990s, witchcraft was seen as a fairly tendential subject within supposedly serious, inverted commas, academia. So there's that, if you like, academic baggage to go to it. On the other hand, though, given within a university setting, within perhaps a societal setting, the collapse of social history, the collapse of interest in what people, you know, the great majority of people thought and did, worked at, how their lives intertwined and joined, which persecution allows us to do a number of things. It allows us to look at studies in microcosm, in this case of a particular area of southwest England and Devon. It allows us to look at place. It allows us, if you like, to take a, a subsection society and look, look at the, the tensions that were bubbling away in there, like an overheated cauldron. And also, through trial records, Unfortunately, these are the things in which ordinary women and men speak to us most clearly with their own words. Now, they may have been filtered, they may have been coerced, there may be all kinds of things going on. They may have wanted to please their accusers. 
but you do get direct patterns of speech and you do get an empirical because even early modern courts had a certain flavour of the desire for empirical evidence. So you do touch base with people's lives and a lived reality that is absent almost everywhere else. Actually, that's a good point. I mean, as a lawyer, it's not, it's not a reason for open justice that I think of perhaps often enough that you can create a historical record um, of society that you, wouldn't, that you wouldn't otherwise have. I have to say, John, um, your book confounded some of my expectations mm -hmm. about, um, uh, about witch hunts. Mm -hmm. I guess, if I'm honest, I'd fallen into the lazy um, understanding that, um, that they were medieval, mm -hmm. um, necessarily rural, essentially about the sort of ignorant superstitions of, of, of poorer people and would ultimately inevitably be defeated by um, enlightenment mm -hmm. um, uh, elites. Mm -hmm. and, and your book sort of confounds, confounds that stereotype, if you like. Well, that's one of the major, major points of it, actually. I think the sort of driving focus that... And that's what makes Biddeford so fascinating, because you get this little, little seaport that is greater than the sum of its parts. It's a boom town. It's the second biggest entrepot for tobacco in this period. It's urban. It's not rural. It's on the way up during this period. It's remarkably late this case, they, you know, the three women of Biddeford were the last three women to be judicially executed in England, and it happens in 1682. So that's the age of restoration comedy, Charles II squatting on the throne, um, the sense of, as you say, the royal society and a burgeoning enlightenment. Now, this isn't to say the enlightenment should be pulled off its pedestal, by no means, because, you know, later in the book you get somebody like John Holt, the great reforming lawyer who did so much to remove the taint of witchcraft from the statute books and to administer what I think everybody hopefully would acknowledge as justice. But at this point, the witch hunts are driven by the elites. There are no, apart from Joan of Arc being the, 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 the most obvious um, and glamorous one, there are... The medieval period is not characterised by outbreaks of witch hunts. It just doesn't happen. They've got other preoccupations. Now, some of those preoccupations may have been equally awful. You know, the Baltic Crusades, the, cru you know, the Crusades elsewhere amongst them. But witches didn't really figure on the radar. And there is this generational conflict bubbling up from about the reign of Elizabeth I and then later James VI in Scotland onwards, where it's the young Turks of the universities and into our period in the 1660s, the Royal Society, kicking over the traces. So Scott and Weyer, who were the earlier generation of witchcraft sceptics, are absolutely hated by James I and VI. You know, later in the day, you'd be lucky enough to hear Mar Marion Gibson, who's written beautifully on the, on the impact of King James in all of this. Mm. So... You, you've got... Yeah, it, James I is not a hero in this, in, no, he's in not. this story but, at all. Just, just as a spoiler. Yeah, spoiler yeah. alert, too late. Um, but, but he has all, all the sort of mixed signals that you get from Biddeford's own elites, that you've got somebody who in many other respects is incredibly progressive. You know, he's a peacemaker. He's that rare thing amongst British monarchs, an intellectual. Um, <laughs> You know, he writes the counterblast of tobacco that people would see, you know, Dolan Hill would have been clapping their hands delightedly in the British Library in the 1950s over James I. On the other hand, he has this massive fear that, that seeps into every pore of his body about witchcraft. And the link between him, because it's... it's it's not true. There used to be this very Victorian patronising notion that King James came south and somehow became enlightened and more liberal. You know, once he got to Whitehall and the English, it was the barbaric Scots who had these notions of witches. And it's all nonsense. When they republish his book, the King's book, with all his stuff, you know, compiled when he takes over the English throne, they don't redact his demonology. 
he still keeps the belief. And the this is why it links to Biddeford and later witchcraft and the terrible layer of, you know, you may call it solipsism, but a form of rationality about witch belief. Um, because it is a quasi, it is an academic pursuit at this period. That's what the science of demon demonology is in the 17th century. The, the England's mm. advice to jurymen, which was the handbook. So if you think, you know, you got called as a yeoman to sit on a jury, it takes its advice over witches from King James's demonology. So you're acting within the law, the best mm. practice. You know, you think today, you get your little compliance note from HR. And if he was sitting there in 1682 in Exeter, it would say there are such things as witches mm. because it's there in scripture, it's in classical sources, it's embodied. So to wind back for a moment, mm. yeah. um, obviously the book is, is a broader has a broader mm -hmm. history. That's the wonderful thing mm. about the book. There's a, there's a broader study of the times, but it is also the, the, the particular story of Temperance Lloyd, yeah. Susanna Edwards and Mary Trembles. Yeah. Why... Why do they die so late? Why are they tried so late? I think there, there are a number of things. Sheer bad luck. That's one thing you can't take away from them. At every stage, if one of them had had anybody to speak for them at all, particularly a man, but anybody with money, they might still have got off. We'll maybe sum up at the end with the circumstances of how it might, they might have escaped the noose, actually. They might have got a reprieve, as was intended, actually, when the jury returned against them. They're profoundly unlucky. They jar within their local community. They get everything wrong. They're, they're, they're marginal in every sense that counts, and we'll come back to this word uh, again and again, I guess that in terms of their gender, in terms of their poverty, in terms of not having familial links, um, in terms of their age, you know, that the, they, in, in a time of, you know, uh, lesser lifespans, they are visibly worn and elderly women. You know, the, one of the trial judges writes his account that if an artist had looked for all across England to look for types of the most broken down, haggardly, gap-toothed women with roomy eyes who were garrulous, he could not have done better by finding these three particular models. They, they get there because of misfortune, the misfortune of poverty, and the fact that in terms of the way that they beg and they seek charity and they try and make their livings, they, they get across people. They, they rise their hackles. So Temperance Lloyd, for instance, everything that could go wrong for her goes wrong. And we have, this is the fascinating thing, these women lived not as, not as long as was made out by the pamphleteers who said they were very old, they were somewhere between about 60 and 70, as far as, you can, as, far as I can recover their, their ages. But they were so broken down by poverty, they appeared a heck of a lot older. So when temperance gets literally a windfall, this is how bad her luck is, she manages to glean some apples, and she tries to sell them in the market, and a young mother comes past with her child. And the child is a joke, you know, picks one up out of the basket and makes off with it through the marketplace at Biddeford. And Lloyd remonstrates, <coughs> bless you. And the mother takes it as the child's joke without realising that those apples are all that that woman had to sell. And of course, within a few weeks, the child sickens and dies. As Temperance Lloyd says on the steps of the scaffold, where she's being bear baited by the mob at Heavy Tree in Exeter. It was smallpox. The child sickened and died. It was no more than that. But they don't want to hear that over misfortune. So you've got a society that is geared to misfortune, high child mortality. Lloyd has very early on the reputation of a witch. So she's brought up, she's tried for it in 1671 for killing a, a yeoman farmer. And, and basically blinding a, a, a serving woman. She's brought up in 1679 when another child dies. And then she's tipped in 1682. And in the earlier, the earlier trials and, and, 
um, accusations, she has, has enough sense to deny everything. She doesn't do that, and her colleagues don't do it in 1682 for various reasons. What is that? Is it some kind of, is it exhaustion? Well, is I it think fatalism? I think, I, th I think it's, yeah, I think it is that. I think it's perhaps the onset of senility. I think things are different in 1682. She is, she's stri strip-searched strip at the time of her first trial. So they're looking for witches marks. You know, this idea in demonology that, that the witch is subhuman. That this is the other reason why witches are so feared. That the demonic pact with Satan means that when you get your new witch name, when you've sealed the pact, you become less than human. You grow supernumerary teats. You take to yourself familiar spirits, that particularly English and, and at times Scottish variation, small animals that, you know, are your, are your helpers, are your, are your sort of would-be demons. So she searched for the, for the marks. They don't find them in the earlier cases because she's a younger woman. Right. By 1682, she has in her uterus probably cancerous polypses that they find and they make much of. Now, if, if we all think about ourselves, particularly when you get to my age, we all have things that could be said to look like a witch's mark somewhere on us, you know, some blemish. But these <laughs> things are taken as, as proof positive. When you think that you've got, if you can imagine 17th century society where in a bit like, you know, traditional Islamic <coughs> societies today, women would not go uncovered in terms of their heads. You know, you'd wear a hat, a scarf, your hair would be, you know, bound up. If you imagine that Temperance Lloyd is subject to a public strip search, Aldous Huxley has the terrifying analogy in his wonderful, wonderful study of the, the Devils of Laodun, where he describes there the strip search on one of the nuns as being like a rape in a public lavatory. And that's kind of what you're seeing with, with this process of these things. Um, so you've got that going on. She is run down by the mob to the local church, and then they tell her to, to recite the Lord's Prayer, and she stumbles over the words. So, you know, you can imagine being made to recite something where you've got a baying mob of a, a hundred people at your back, you know? So these are sort of proof positive. So you stumble over but, the prayer and therefore you're, and, and therefore you're, you're in with the devil, you, right? You can't get the words out. Now, in her case, it might have been no more that she came from a Puritan Welsh background, you know, that the language was of itself different or that the changes in church government from the time she'd been a girl through the civil wars. So to cut altered. in there, there yeah. is this undercurrent in the, in the book about, there is a sort of, well, undercurrent, no, there is this background mm -hmm. of um, political strife yeah. and at times political vacuum mm -hmm. and also um, religious, re mainstream religious yeah. conflict mm -hmm. um, because we've had the restoration yeah. um, and, and so on. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think, I think the other thing, the fascinating thing about Biddeford is nobody in Biddeford is who or what they seem or in the right place at the right time. If the women are out of kilter, the whole town is out of kilter. This is a place which was your typical Puritan, relatively homogeneous seaport. However, the Civil War and the restoration of Charles II, you know, there's a reason that J.M. Barry took Charles II as the model for Captain Hook. You know, there, there is, there is a, a malignant cruelty to Charles II that I think very few people, with the exception of Ronald Hutton, actually, who wrote the biography of Charles II, actually get close at. There's an inherent nastiness and a brutality in the restoration project. The people at the top of society are young, brutalised men who'd come through a civil war where their class and their privilege had been challenged and they'd gone into exile for the best part of 20 years. They come back, just like the Earl of Bath, who was the, the squire in Biddeford, and they're determined to get even and have a good time. What this means in Biddeford is that the natural rulers, the, the organic governors, 
are all shoved out of the way because they'd all been on the losing side of, by 1660. They're prohibited by 1662 of worshipping in the way they want, Presbyterian form of worship, rather than in the newly established church of the state, and they can't stand for office. So everybody who's in the town council knows that they don't represent the majority of people in the town. It gets worse as the repressions go on. This is, this is an area of the country, some of you might have read Lorna Doone or uh, Conan Doyle's wonderful novel of Sedgemoor when you were young. You've got the Monmouth Rising just bubbling, you know, three years later in this part of the country. There is a political radical underground seething in the southwest of England, looking as Monmouth as the king in waiting. And these are people who are targeted in Biddeford. So you've got the clergy who've been chucked out. So the minister who was there, Bartlett and his son, are hunted fugitives. You've got a tier of Tory authority over the town who know they're unrepresentative. And you've got an absentee landlord at the top of it. And into all this, when no one is in the right place, <laughs> comes this guy, Francis Han, who comes from nowhere, and he's not the minister. He's an outsider. He's an outsider to the parish, and he slips in, and it's with all these things, nature pulls a vacuum, and I think Francis Han sets out to make a reputation for himself as a witch hunter, and he does his best to do that over the course of running to ground the three women of Biddeford. They are literally the scape. So you've got you've got Catholics and Protestants. Well, two, two different types of Protestants. Two different there types aren't of any Catholics. There no, are, they're gone, right? Well, so they, they've, they've, they're well gone. You've got different area. kinds of Protestants. Yeah. You've got Tories and Whigs. But yeah. but the hatred of the women seems mm -hmm. to be a sort of unifier across these spectrums. Yeah. Yeah. And so much in your book is a commentary on gender and class. Mm -hmm. Yeah. From the gender perspective, you, I think you, you put it very delicately, um, because you're a very delicate um, feminist man, you, you put very delicately the 1970s feminist theory that, um, that witch hunting and demonising women as witches was really about medicine women who, you know, who took control of medicine and, 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 and took control over midwifery and their bodies. And I think you say very delicately that this would be a great theory if it were only supported by the by the evidence yeah. which it isn't quite is no. it no it's not in, in fact if you look at Biddeford the midwives are the ones doing the strip searching mm -hmm. and a lot of the, the the core accusations come from young relatively wealthy women with children against old poor women either without children or the children are dead or have abandoned them. So it's that kind of tension. There's this abjection it's, of the older, the older, but the older woman who's poor. Exactly. The older woman who's yeah. forced to beg yeah. for and, whatever reason. And, and if we think about that, if we think about the process of begging, there was a chap just, you know, I walked past, as you do, outside the gates to the library about an hour, hour and a half ago, and it brought it all home. If you think today about the different ways people can beg, and the 17th century, you know, after the Reformation, charity collapses in these aisles, the great monasteries and all the foundations that were there to, you know, the poor could get a dole of some kind, they all go, okay? In Biddeford, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. It's as simple as that. And there's no safety net to catch them. So within this, you imagine yourselves, and it doesn't take, I think, much imagination to put yourselves in the position of those women. What you see, and the, the great surviving source, is the doll book where these women get pennies, you know, thanks to a local philanthropist, and um, a guy called Andrew. Um, what you do get is a sense that, obviously, women banded together. Very often, it's clear that they were they were begging in twos or threes in the town. Now, it doesn't take two seconds to think why. You're less likely to be raped. You're less likely to be physically attacked. You know, go figure, folks. But also, because of that, there are different ways, just like the chap I saw before, you know, giving the blessings of his God to anybody who would, you know, um, throw some money 
in his cup. There are different ways to beg. There, and you can see it in post, you know, in Havel's Prague or post Havel Prague. The, the abasement in Eastern Europe of beggars there. You know, you'll have people who are just like living statues for, for arms to be dropped into their tin cups. Or you can have the, the people hated of Tony Blair, the aggressive beggar. Right. Now, everyone who is in that abject position has to take a decision. How are they going to get their next meal? How are they going to get warmth? How are they going to get sustenance? In the case, and this goes back to why they were targeted as, as beggars, they clearly, the women don't have strength. What they have are their mouths. They've, they, can, they can reach out. So, and Temperance Lloyd gets this wrong. When she wants to appear soft, she appears hard. So Grace Thomas, the woman whose accusations sparked all of this, she's afflicted by some kind of nervous order that eventually kills her a bit, bit down the line. And she gets a reprieve and she starts going out into the night air and walking, taking the air. And she runs into Temperance Lloyd. And Temperance, probably for the sake of a penny or a halfpenny, wants to appear, wants to show her sisterhood, and runs up to her and says, oh, mistress, I'm so glad you're better. This is wonderful. This is the best thing. But she scares the living daylights out of the woman. Because, you know, in her, her rags... her anti-social behaviour. Her, her rags and tatters and filth. And, and it seems she knows something about her condition. It's kind of, mm. how do you know about me? How do you know about my case? Why are you doing this? Why are you invading my personal space? Worse to come a little while later when Grace has another relapse. The, the, the women who help her, her sisterhood, effectively, who come in as a support network, are cleaning out her chamber after a bad night where none of them have slept in the East Church household. And suddenly a magpie starts in at the window, gets into the chamber, and they startle it. And the creature, you know, you know what a bird is like in a trap room, you know, that wonderful line out of a, of a Russian pop song, like a blackbird caught in barbed wire. You, this thing flies and dashes itself against the window and terrifies them. They calm themselves down, and about an hour later, the household is, is kind of getting itself together, and there's a scritching and a scratching, and literally by the, beside the door, beside the window... They open the door, and lo and behold, who's there but Temperance Lloyd eavesdropping? So the, the narrative appears to be linked. The appearance of the bird is not just some random thing. It's linked to the appearance of the beggar woman. There's yeah. also this thing with familiar spirits in Biddeford and the witches that by their begging, they're performing the same sort of functions that little... <laughs> animals scavenging magpies pigs for the sake of the gods uh, cats all those things are doing along the quayside they're all going for the scraps of meat and the bits of tobacco so the begging and the actions of the women in gleaning looks like the animals seem to be their demons if you get my point and and the problem just to finish with that incident with temperance this is why i said at the top her luck fails her so persistently if when the door flew open, she'd have given an account of herself, I was begging, I was eavesdropping, I'm sorry. What she does is she runs off. And of course, that gap allows all kinds of bad thoughts to, to, to flourish. So if we think today, go back to the beggar in the street selling the big issue. None of us have the money to solve the problem of poverty but we wish we could. So you walk past that person and you feel bad, I think, or most of us would, about not being able to help them. If you then hear a muffled, I'll get you and your little dog too, kind of comment, we'd probably feel unnerved by it today, or upset. In the 17th century, where words and oaths have real power, yeah. that maybe stays with you. You, you spin 180 degrees your feelings of guilt over the yeah. person to turning that person into a symbol of hatred and resentment, and then something to goes the wrong your life. To the annoying antisocial yeah. um, person that makes you feel bad about yeah. yourself and your society yeah. has to be totally 
has to be demonised. Yeah, literally demonised in this case. And I note, yeah. I note that in the coda to your yeah. history, you, I think I'm right, you say that when witchcraft legislation was eventually mm -hmm. um, repealed, it was replaced with the Vagrancy Act. Yeah, yeah. And That's the, the uh, it's a simple trade-off. It's, it's a simple trade-off, that and, that and later the fraudulent mediums, but it's, it's other ways of dealing with vagrancy. And I think in the Victorian period, one of the things I talk about in the book, there's this marvellous character, uh, Marianne Vauden, who Sabine Bear and Gould, the great writer of folk song, encountered. And Gould, again, talking about the failure of the witch figure in, in our society, Gould could have saved Marianne Vauden quite easily from the fate of the poorhouse, being sent to the workhouse, and he doesn't bother. But he tries to buy a spell book off her, you know? And he makes money out of her by, by writing her up as a fictional character. And as, you know, so you write several essays about her. The point is, by the Victorian age, the old, the poor, the derelict are being criminalised in a different way and stuck into workhouses. Right. They're not there amidst society. They're not out there causing trouble. In the same way as we think about witchcraft as being a particularly harsh reaction, at the same time this is happening in Biddeford, an indigent young man, a failed apprentice, gets whipped out of the town and sent to a house of correction. So it's the way of removing people who are difficult and there is no obvious solution to them and just make that affluent, acquisitive society feel really bad about itself. Why were these three the last? I mean, if, 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 if we're yeah. confident they yeah. were the last, the, why, were, why were they the last to be, to be hanged? There's, there's possibly another woman, um, Alice Mulland or Mulholland, who might have gone to the gallows after them. But the thing is, and loads of people have tried to find out her story, there's nothing. You know, I've tried, other people have tried. She may have been hanged, she may have been pardoned. I think it's interesting that there's no ballad or pamphlet literature, because then as now, I'm afraid, witch is sold. You know, <laughs> so Han, the witch hunter, is trying to get his version of the story out of there, and popular ballad writers in London are putting songs out about the women within a year. So they're the last for a number of reasons. They're the last because society is changing, in shorthand. The much derided thing, the European Enlightenment, is beginning to, to get in there because in the South West, Judge Jeffries is busily hunting rebels and political um, um, troublemakers rather than spiritual troublemakers. So, you know, you're, you're basically sending thousands of people after the failure of Monmouth's rebellion, either to the gallows or as um, indentured labor, white slavery to the New World, to Jamaica in that period. And then you've got people who stick out and make the, the very brave, I think, and, and injurious to their reputations and careers argument that witchcraft was a pseudoscience and was just nonsense. So in, in my case, if you like, if there is one man who is vaguely heroic or decent in the book, it's this guy, Sir John Holt, who isn't a household name, but I think deserves to be. And Holt totally inverts by 1702 the, the judicial system. So coming back to your role as a campaigning lawyer, we've got this guy who is a campaigning lawyer on all kinds of things. He's an early champion of, of slavery um, at a time when it, it certainly wasn't a popular position. Of abolishing slavery. Of abolishing yeah. slavery, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of saying you can't extend it into England. But what he does very cleverly, he can't overturn the act You've got one of the things that comes up loud and clear at Salem, which, of course, is, is, may even be influenced by Biddeford, and it's slightly down the line. Once Matthew Hale, in 1662, brings in rulings and court precedents that says there is spectral evidence that is admissible in court, okay? Think of the, think of the crucible, you know. Yeah. A witness has a fit in the courtroom and says she can see a spirit hovering over that young woman's head, and you have to admit that as evidence... How do you go about yeah. counteracting yeah. that evidence? What, yeah. what Holt does is he strikes at that and then he turns the balance of proof. 
So in 1701, and this is almost the, the, the opposite and how lawyers and judiciary mm. positively change the world, he does everything different yeah. to Lord North and Lord Raymond. Yeah. He looks at the, the guy, there's, there's a young leader of apprentices who I kind of imagine is a bit sort of, I don't know, sort of an unedifying combination of Raoul Moat and Nigel Farage. And this guy has, and he has all that popularism. You know, he's a big swaggering apprentice and he has the mob out for this poor wo woman, Alice Mordyke, or the wonderfully prosaic Alice Morduck, as she's described in one of the things, this really inoffensive woman who her neighbours actually like. And they try and lynch her. You know, they rip her hair out, they try and scratch her. A group of soldiers turn up and give her a kicking. She escapes to St Paul's over the river from Southwark. The, the apprentices turn out and run her down there. It's only a young doctor who saves her being lynched then. And she gets into the courtroom. And Raymond, sorry, um, Holt, tears apart the evidence and then has, because the two things he really hates are mob rule and the military. He loathes them both. And in this case, before him, in the, you know, in the, in the prosecution witness stand, are a group of soldiers and a group of apprentices. And at the end of the acquittal of Mordyke, he has them arrested for perjury. And a year later, he has them tried, and he makes sure he's the judge, and he has them flogged and jailed, and he has them brutally flogged. So suddenly, coming along to court and saying, you know, so-and-so is a witch, suddenly the balance of proof has shifted yeah. and you might end up with marks on your back if it goes wrong. So, the, so yeah, terror... The law is being used the other way. The terror in society shifts. Sure. So be before, we're about to open this up, a yeah. final question for mm -hmm. me is about contemporary learning, what, what we mm -hmm. ought to be learning and, and the contemporary yeah. relevance of, of witches and mm -hmm. witch hunts. On the one hand, we now think of, I don't know... Uh, Harry Potter and Sabrina mm -hmm. the Teenage Witch and all these apparently positive mm -hmm. um, almost celebrations of, 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 of these characters mm -hmm. um, in complete contrast with, with, with how witches or alleged yeah. witches were once treated. On the other hand, we still have in our culture, in our politics, in our language, the concept of the witch hunt mm. yep. in all sorts of places for all yeah. sorts of reasons. So we've got this, this sort of contradiction between witches as a celebration of femininity, of difference, of spirituality almost, mm -hmm. and then the witch hunt, this yeah. terrifying, this terror mm -hmm. that can come upon a society and a community. We're, so we're torn in two directions mm -hmm. there. Do you want to say something about that? Yeah, I mean... It, it... It's an enormous topic, but I think in, in shorthand, for a, for a very simple response, there are two different things going on within that pattern. There is the total re-evaluation of the figure of, me, of the witch that begins with a French historian called Jules Michelet in the mid-19th century. And what Michelet does is he creates, for the first time, the feminised witch. He's the first person to do it. Then, in rough shorthand... Dear old Gerald Gardner comes along after the Second World War, agitates for the repeal of the last witchcraft acts. And what he does, his genius, and it is genius, whatever anybody else says about Gerald, he had this, this one thing, that he does what Michelet the academic couldn't do. He separates the devil from the figure of the witch. And once you take Satanism at the equation and say it's all Judeo-Christian and accretion, that the witch is, as you said earlier, although there's no historical fact for it, the witch is her herbalist in touch with the feminine, the goddess, the earth, you know, da 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 da, -da. You get the recasting of the witch for the first time since the classical age as a symbol of beauty, of empowerment, of age, of wisdom, all those kinds of really positive things, which are incredible, that rightly, surprise, surprise, second-wave feminist authors tune into, because that's exactly it. Now, what they're looking at is the negation of that is the historical witch hunt. 
they're writing polemic, and I have to say, a lot of predominantly male authors on the subject set them up as straw women to be battered down. And it's a thing for another day, because they don't read it like the political polemic. It was supposed right. to be in 1969, 1972, about the right to yeah. abortion, the right to women's it's rights. It's polemic, not history. Stuff. Exactly, right. and they don't get it. You know, it's, it's like me, you know, it's like the famous Liverpool joke about the guy from the Liverpool Echo who is sent, you know, as a, as a young reporter to do the book reviews, and he reviews the, the phone book and says it's got a wonderful cast but no plot. You know, that inability to read a text for what it's kind of telling you. So that gives you the Sabrinas, the Charmed, all the stuff that's rebooted, all those things that I think are incredibly positive in the sense, just like witchcraft back then, they gave the, the powerless a sense of power. Now, to bridge to your second point, point of the question about modernity it's that bridging arc that is the two things that you can take a feel for the if you like the modern revived witch you know with I don't know pewter figures and crystals and you know various mm. aromas and whatever but I kind of feeling that's only part of the way because it's intensely individualistic what Biddeford tells you is that there is a collective sense of loss and disempowerment and really horrible stuff happening to people. And it's translating that sympathy from a safely dead cause, which are the witch hunts of the early modern period, to translating it into modern periods, modern hatreds, the, the whole question, as we just said, about begging, about modern uh, poverty, where you might not be on the right side of history, where it might directly affect you, that you might lose a living or you might lose friends or you might have rotten things said about you, just as Sir John Holt did. So that connection that is made beautifully by Arthur Miller in The Crucible about modernity, about the anti-communist witch hunts in the, in the 1950s has, I think an incredible resonance with our age that deals, as we all know, in Twitter land with mm. 30 characters or less. So you're making snap judgments and you, you are... There, I'm not saying you, but there is one. a tendon <laughs> one can demonise individuals or whole groups of people yeah. very, very simply. And it, that, that judgment can tour the world. And it's in different ways. So today, I mean, this is, this is just a level of the, the, the strangeness, I think. If you think about the witch figure, I don't think the witch figure is the old deer living alone with her cats in a ramshackle cottage. Now, that was still there in the 1970s when I was a kid because the village I grew up in, they had a witch's cottage with an old deer, probably with dementia, who had cats. And every mischief night, because Halloween wasn't really celebrated in Merseyside, the local Tufts used to put our windows out. Mm -hmm. So that stuff still survived. Today, I think the, 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 the most obvious analogy with the witch is actually the single man who maybe train spots, who's a bit odd, you know? What's he doing talking to our children? You can see those, those levels of disquiet projected into different social areas because the great thing history tells you is you can't replicate incidences or particular forms of thought. thought. So with the book, there is a disjuncture that I'm trying to get people to see between looking at the early modern, which is a profoundly different way of looking at the world, and what you can extrapolate to our modernity. And why the 17th century is so fascinating is it is that battle mm. between the early modern and the modern that gets us to where we are. And we forget at our cost yeah. the sufferings that had to be made to get there, the risks run, and that sense of enlightenment values of tolerance and respect and decency and a legal system that works didn't just have to be fought for in 1701 by Holt, but have to be fought for every day of our lives. Thank you, John. Uh, we can have some applause now. And, and well, some more later. Um, but, um, but not for too long, because, <laughs> because we, must, we must open up the discussion. Now, who, who um, put my specs on so that I can see you? You lovely people. Who has um, something they'd like to say, ask? Yes, please. I, I tell you what I'll do. I'll do groups of three so we can get more people in. Um, 
And we've got a, a lovely yellow mic. Thank yeah. you. That was really interesting. Um, I'm really interested to know more about the role that you say the midwives had in mm -hmm. the strip searching of the Biddeford witches, because as a midwife myself, we're led to believe that we, we were persecuted. We were the herbalist in the village that made medicines, and if they went wrong, then we would be accused right. of being witches. So Excellent how question. did that then yeah. From become... the perfect questioner for that. Yeah, and, uh, and someone else, please. Um, I've got someone over... Over there, making you a oh, great we've got two mics. Wow, there's organisation. Because it's the British Library. Yeah, two mics. Um, please. Sorry, mine's my question's a bit um, different, but there's kind of a growing popular belief. So, like the old popular belief of the witch hunts was very much kind of that medieval idea of you know people being burned and so on. And I've personally seen other people might have as well, um, particularly in like left-wing circles online, a theory of the witch hunts and kind of land ownership. So people being accused um, of witchcraft and the trials going on over the desire for land that that person okay. might have owned. And obviously the Biddeford witches, witches mm -hmm. didn't own land. Right. So, kind of how okay, um, really the document tri documented trials fit in with excellent, that and, what, and perhaps one more. So we, we can probably hold three questions in our heads at at a time. Please. Hi. Sorry, I'm just going to try and phrase this properly. How was um, old age viewed back in the uh, 17th century? So, was it a particular number, or was it about? Um, I don't know if it's the right word, yeah, yeah, yeah. usefulness. Yeah. yeah. That's really no, that's, that's, that's great. So actually. so we've got midwives, yep. land, and, and old age. Right, okay. Midwives. <laughs> that like you can see why, and I'm going to go back to the second wave of feminist writers, mainly coming out of the, the west coast of the USA in the late 1960s, early 1970s centred on midwifery. They're struggling for the right, for autonomy, for, for women's, you know, reproduction, for abortion, all those kinds of stuff that's very alive. Who would have thought it now in the States? So it's a woman's right to autonomy over their own body. They look at the rise of the medical profession. They have a very countercultural disdain of the man, you know, in both senses of the word, and the expert. And the sense that alternative therapies are coming in. And the midwife seems to be the figure that holds this. Now, like everything, it's, there are instances of midwives being persecuted. Okay? There are the exceptions that prove the rule. However, across Western Europe, which is what we're looking at, and into North America, the midwife is more likely to be doing the accusing than to be the accused. And that is just basically the statistical trial fact. So when you get the, the, the case of, of Francis Lady Howard, who was accused by the Earl of Essex as being a witch just before the Civil War, women strip-searched her just as they had with um, the, you know, Temperance Lloyd. So it was, it was part of the evidence gathering, and they were... They were you know, they were taken, you know, they were taken in as experts and their, their advice taken. So basically, you know, the, the, the midwives are seen in a, as you'll know, in a very developmental stage of medical knowledge as being on the side of authority rather than the outcasts. Yeah, that's that's what that's what we're basically looking at. It doesn't at. mean that mi modern modern no. midwives haven't been important no, representatives of the not. good or, and bad lawyers, good and bad good doctors, and, exactly. good and bad humans. Or, or that they're called in to do a job, examine this woman and look for polypses. I mean, that's it, isn't it? You, we've all you know, we've all we've all been in circumstances where you're asked a very particular um, question, and it also leads into the you know. The, the whole point of witchcraft being pernicious and the witch hunt being pernicious is it kind of makes sense. It has rules, and this is what I'm saying. It's not blind mob violence, although it can manifest itself as blind mob violence. It's something that was honed from the time of Joan of Arc and the University of Paris by the great legal, academic, 
theologian, theological minds, and it's given practical applications. I think you're right. I think, experts. John, you, make a re you made a really good point earlier about, about the law of evidence in an illegal system, and it's incredibly powerful. It's a very boring um, mm. part of the law. It's very procedural. It's not sexy law, but it's so powerful when you determine what is and is not admissible relevant evidence and who is the expert witness. I mean, this is a contested issue even to this day. There are ex-cops being called by their mates to talk about drill music and to say that a young black kid who's listened to drill music is more likely to be a gangster. And that's an expert witness. Yeah. It doesn't mean that all expert witnesses are, yeah. you know, are, but this is modern quackery as far as, as, far as yeah, I'm yeah. concerned. Yeah. Um, there was a question about land. Yeah. So with land, the, the simpler, well, let's go back to the medieval bit. There are high profile cases in the late Middle Ages of women being targeted. Okay, so Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester's mistress is, is taken out by a political trial because Gloucester's enemies wanted, wanted him off the Regency Council for, for Henry VI. When we're looking at this period, there, there are very plausible and very popular arguments about the Salem witch trials, that there was an issue of land ownership around Salem. I think the, the most recent work on Salem has tended to discount that. So, you know, it could be seen as a battle of land in a frontier society there. Within, within a Western European context, the people overwhelmingly running for witchcraft own nothing. That's the simple thing. It's about a different kind of power. It's about the powerful kicking the powerless. And there is this thing, yes, that witch hunters, you know, can seize portions of people's goods, and you do see that in the German hunts. You do have the occasion of Bamberg uh, in Germany, where it's a, it's a very top-down hunt begun by the the sexually titled witch bishop of Bamberg, a guy called, um, well, it's Fauna, his, his deputy, who does it all, but the witch bishop directs this. And there it takes hold on itself like wildfire. It starts from digging down at the lowest levels, but it rips apart the whole functioning of that state by the end, you know? It's so bad, they, they've burned so many people that when the Swedish troops get there in the Thirty Years' War, there's nobody manning the defences anymore because the whole system of government has collapsed. But as a, as a rule of thumb, it's not about land grabs. I think what it is about is enforcing a particular religious view of the world where God is imminent. This is, this is the key to this period. And I think this explains a lot about why witch trials come so late when they do. You, you've got a battle in this period between... The old idea that is rejuvenated by the Royal Society that God is imminent. What do we mean by that? Well, it's the Old Testament God who throws a thunderbolt at you. You know, gets out of bed one morning, bump. The easiest verses, you know, the sort of modern Church of England, you know, God was around in the world once but then went on holiday, you know? <laughs> um, and he's, he's somewhere there but moves in terribly forgiving. mysterious... Forgiving but an absent landlord, right? <laughs> okay? So we've got these two views of the divine. Seven, late 17th century is a battleground between these two contesting ideas about the way God works. And the easiest way to prove in providences, in a, in a divine battle for souls, is over witchcraft. It's an easy way for people to make polemical capital, and by the gods they do. By the gods they do. So um, on, the th on the third one, age, which age. is an absolutely brilliant question, somebody, hint, hint, um, needs to write a book about age in the in the early modern period. I mean, it would be a great PhD thesis for some, you know, some young academic or maybe some, older academic. Yeah, I was going to say, why do I have um, to be young? Well, exactly. Well, I was just... <laughs> if you're was just older, thinking, you've exactly, done your field right, work, haven't exactly. you? Exactly, that's, that's very true. I think, I think, I think there, there are... The old poor are a curiosity. That's what we're looking at here. There is an, an enormous societal gulf. You know, the, you see it in Shakespeare, you know, the different ages of man, don't you? 
old age is not pretty at that period. Without an NHS, without modern dentistry, without hormone replacement therapy, <laughs> without, well, you know, without Speak cosmetic... For well, without cosmetic... <laughs> Well, it happens to men, you know. You think about the way men go west, you know. <laughs> you think about, you know, you know. You look at the Rolling Stones no, but, and no, see, no, even no. with their, you know, it's like reanimated, you know. No, but there's a serious um, point. But the, the, the serious point about it is that, that the, the workings of age on people are profoundly disturbing. Yeah. If you're lucky and you know, people who made it to maturity and, and, you know, it's not true in the late Middle Ages and early modern period that, you know, your life expectancy once you're out of childhood was much different to it is now. What you're looking at in those mortality rates, and this comes back to the wonderful impact of midwives, is that child mortality was so vast. So one in three of this audience would have been dead by the time they were 12 in the 17th century, okay? Those are the simple facts. If you got through your first 12 years, chances were you were so strong, very little would stop you. <laughs> you know, war, pandemics, that kind of stuff, okay? But it's very clear within the context of Biddeford, and particularly in the context of the judges who tried those three women, that they had never experienced anything like these three. That the combination, this, this smear of sexual license that's projected onto them. Susanna Edwards may have, may have been a prostitute at some point, we don't know. Temperance Lloyd might have, but we've got no way of proving it. I don't think Mary Trembles was for a minute. But th this idea of sexual license, age, the very fact that Temperance Lloyd is seen as the grand dam, and this comes back again and again, it's located in, you know, that she's lived a long life where she's been able to subvert so many other people, that these are all profoundly troubling things yeah. and are not trying to reduce the impact and misogyny on and Gra And Grace Thomas herself is an older single woman is. living with the yeah. nice, respectable yeah. married couple that's, right. that's her sister and brother-in-law. Yeah. yeah. And that's all a bit uncomfy, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Anything like that, unattached women, Dangerous. and particularly unattached women without money, yeah. are very, very troubling, and it goes up the spectrum. So to, to cut to the quick, you have the idea of age bestowing wisdom, but you also have the idea that age is degenerate in both senses of the word, yeah. oh. and, and that the witches represent that absolute canker and the, the lack of understanding, and I, I maybe before we go on to maybe a couple of minutes to run over for another q and I think I, I, just something I want to get across over this, the savagery of that trial and the, the misogyny embodied in class difference is there in the way that Francis Lord North writes up his report when the women have been judged guilty. And he has the killer quotes about them, you know, their decrepitude and their melancholy. And he knows it's, a, it's the most savagely, cynically calculated letter to the chief of state, the secretary of state back in London, who could have given a, a reprieve. I think most people expected them to get a reprieve. Yeah. This is what happens in many, many early modern cases. It's quite rare to end up twitching at the end of a rope, in actual fact, in early modern mm. England. What he does is the classic, you know, you wouldn't have seen like that, but it's the Jesuit, Jesuitical pivot. He uses the, the, the arguments for giving them a pardon as reasons why they shouldn't. And what he says is, you and I are men of the world, and we know this is all fantasy, and we know these old women are afflicted by melancholy and delusions. We know that, and he takes them into this sort of clubbable space, and we've all seen it. You've probably met them in academic departments or in, uh, among politicians or, you know, you know this, this idea of, you know, we're, we're reasonable, dear boy, you know? Um, there's, this, there's this sense of clubability and, and, and reason. And he says, but of course, we can't suffer to let these women live because of the signal it would give to the mob. And if you want to let them off, the mob would be empowered 
we would have rebellion in the West Coast. So give them what they want, give them give blood. Them meat. Give them the fresh meat and we can move along and it's nothing to do with us. And it is the most chilling example of, you know, like Pilate washing his hands. That's what this guy is doing. And for too long, I think, the witches have been seen through that prism of the North brothers who wrote the accounts of the case, where they could be dismissed on that level. And I don't think they were worth dismissing. Look, I'm really sorry we have run out of time, but I think that's not a bad place to close it, chilling though it is. Um, so it just remains for me to, to thank you all for, for, for coming, uh, to recommend the book, which you can buy. You can buy and, and have some. Well, I mean, you know, they're old. They're well. old and cankerous like me, you know. <laughs> well. <laughs> and and um, older. That's... And um, um, but, but to thank all of you, yeah. uh, do go and buy and read the, the book. And, of course, thank you for this wonderful work to right. John Callow. Thank you. Thank you.